Hi, <laughs> it's Danny Fleming. And Marcus Collins from the MA Properties Online team with your Arlington. And online. I never know whether to call it an online or a virtual seminar. So maybe we'll just say Both. it's a virtual online seminar. Yeah, no, that doesn't sound right. Anyway, um, thank you for joining us. Um, uh, tonight we are streaming on three different channels. We're on Twitch, we're on YouTube, and we're on Facebook. And you will be able to find a recording of this afterwards. Now, you can also ask questions as we're going along. I'm monitoring any chats or any questions that come in and we'll try and answer them during the session if you've got some. And if we can't answer them, we'll get back to you as well um, with that. So on that note, um, the MA Properties Online team, there's uh, seven of us, there's seven agents in the team and we have five full-time support folks. And you can see our dog right there sitting on the sofa. And luckily this evening he's not with us. He was last <laughs> night. He decided to join us and see what was going on last night. Um, and... <laughs> And, Not this evening. Uh, um, and anyway, we'll uh, we'll talk to you about you know what role he has in the team a little bit later as well with the marketing. So let's get going. Um, our agenda for this evening is smart decisions. Um, you especially in this time of coronavirus, um, smart decisions and understanding what's going on in the market is really, really, really important. It's really, really important without the time of coronavirus. With the time of coronavirus, it's really, really, really important. Um, and um, what does selling in 2020 look like? Uh, what does buying in 2020 look like? And what does virtual buying and selling encompass? So let's get going with smart dishes, smart decisions, and that's where Marcus takes over. Perfect. Yeah, and Perfect. I'll try not to interrupt. Yeah, right. My wife will interrupt. We always yeah. do. There we go. So smart decisions, <laughs> information-based approach. So let's take a look at the characteristics of the local market. The way I want to structure this is to look at the the predictions that we made in the January timeframe. Um, some of you may have got a Lexington market review in the in the mail um, that predicted what was going to happen in the Arlington market in 2019. The reason I think it's important to go back to that prediction is that even though we're in a very strange situation right now, quite quickly and in fact quicker quicker than most people anticipated, I think we will be back to the situation that we saw ourselves in previously with some slight changes. So I, that's why I want to kind of focus a little bit on what we said in January, because it's going to play out in some way, shape or form, uh, slightly altered uh, mm -hmm. as the year progresses. So here's the headline stats. Um, median uh, price in Arlington 2019 was just over 820, 821. That's about a 63% rise since the, the number that we saw of 503 in 2005, which was the high point just before this, the crash. Realistically, there really wasn't a crash in, in Arlington. As you can see, the median price went from 503 to 487, nothing at all, Not right. much. nothing yet. So um, solid price increase definitely since 2005, but let's look under the covers and see if we can get a little bit more detail in terms of what's happening there. So the inventory graph that you see at the moment, it tells us or tells us how many homes were available to buy on the first of the month. So the first of the month I go out, I find all of the information, how many homes are there available to buy, and I've been tracking this for a long time. It gives us a really good way to look at the trends in the market. And there are two things, two areas that are really important. The first one is the drop in 2011 and 2012. Um, what happened in these two months is the buyers came out. They decided that the recession, the crash in 2007 and 8 was behind us, and it was now time to jump into the market. They did it about 12 months earlier in Arlington than they did in most other towns. So if you look at Winchester, Lexington, Belmont, that drop in, in inventory levels when the buyers came back into the market was in 2012. Whereas in Arlington, it began to happen in, 20, in, in 2011. So gives you a sense of that. So a year earlier in Arlington, first time home buyers driving that market. But that's what happened uh, historic. That's why that big drop is there. And that's kind of historically what happened. Now, if we fast forward to 2018, 19, and now 2020, you can see in the latter part of 2018, we saw a rise in inventory levels. 
2019 saw a higher level of inventory than we saw in 2018, and certainly a lot lower than we saw historically in the last three, four years before that. Um, so we got more inventory coming on the market um, in those months and not enough buyers to really absorb all of that inventory. So a slightly softer market, second or the, the full market really in 2018 and through 2019, and then we predicted continue into 2020. If we take a look now at the number of home sales, relatively static in the town, they're not fluctuating at all, roughly the same number of homes selling year over year. And so that increase in inventory shows us that more listings were coming on the market, but we essentially that a static number of buyers were out there. We look a lot at a metric, um, which is the sell price to the list price ratio. Um, that metric gives us a, a good understanding in terms of how much buyer confidence there is. So imagine a home comes on the market for 800,000, sells for 800,000, that's a 100% sell price to list price ratio. Um, now, as you can see, since 20, I'll need to look at this, my eyesight isn't quite good enough to look at my display here. <laughs> You've even that. got your glasses no, on. No, no, it's just too small, <laughs> just too small. 2013, if I get the dates right, 2013, it rose, it never really gets, I should say, anywhere below about 95. Even in the crash, it was really, that was the lowest it got to. Um, 2013, you can see when the buyers came back into the market, it rose to over 100%. And that really continued, in fact, peaking in 2017 and 2018 at 104%. But you can see... And you should explain what the sell price to list price ratio is. I just did. Um, and how an average of 104% means that there's more homes that are going under agreement with competing offers than not. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Just checking up and you, you weren't paying attention. I was checking Facebook. to see whether there what were any chats, you, whether anybody my, wanted had any questions. Danny I, on I, Facebook, that's what it was. No. Okay, so here's the key. <laughs> no. That that reduction in uh, that key ratio shows that we saw a slight softening in buyer confidence um, in that 2019 time period. Um, and our predictions were that that would continue into 2020. So median sale price, been rising steadily since uh really since 2010 um peaked you know as you can see in that 18 rose a little bit in 19 but not really very much um here's the the uh, condo market similar characteristics steady rise as we came out of the uh, out of the dip out of the recession slowing just slightly in 2019 so that's kind of the the, the overall picture of, of the market so what's driving this increase in sales and perhaps what's driving, more importantly, what's driving that slight, slight softening of the market uh, that we've seen over the last year or two? Um, to answer that, we really need to look at some demographics. Um, these are the, the demographics for the United States, um, males and females, how many are in each age bracket. And there's two areas which are really important. Um, the top area here are the baby boomers, those uh, children that were born just after World War II. They are now thinking about retirement and therefore thinking about downsizing. The group here, um, which are the millennials, the so-called first-time home buyers, um, that's what that group is. Now, when you think about the characteristics of the home those two groups are looking at, it's very, very similar. Um, so we've got first-time home buyers, we've got downsizers looking for a modest, modestly sized home. In the case of a downsizer, relatively close to where they live right now, but they still want to be close to Boston. In terms of a first time home buyer, relatively close to Boston, a dynamic town. Um, good school system is important for, for both resale and as a first time home buyer, as and when they, they, uh, they have children school age. Um, so Arlington finds itself really downsizers, first time home buyers, all focused very much on Arlington with a good school system, vibrant yeah. town close to Boston. The perfect storm almost the yep. perfect storm in terms of Arlington. Yep. And that's what's been driving the very strong market we've seen in Arlington over the last few years. So that's the positive. On the negative side, a little bit of thought around economic uncertainty. That was the discussion, that was the thought, late uh, 19, early 2020. There is this notion of, of, mm -hmm. of a hat. We weren't really sure, was there gonna be a housing correction? There was certainly this perception that there was going to be economic uncertainty coming along. What that means is 
sellers start to think, maybe I should list my house, house now, not delay any longer, just in case house prices go down. Buyers, on the other hand, thinking, maybe I should delay because if, perhaps if I delay a little longer, house prices will go down. And so we've got more listings coming on the market, a flat, perhaps slightly declining, I think in Arlington, flat buyer demand. And that's what we well, we saw the inventory level slightly increasing. That's why we saw that sell price to list price ratio dip slightly. As Danny said, 104 is a very high number. To put that in perspective, um, the Lexington, Winchester around 98. Um, so it's you know considerably higher than the more expensive towns uh, that we have. So um, it is a very, 104 is a big number. 102 is still you know a relatively big number too. So put, to put that kind of number in perspective. So here's what we were predicting. A um, little bit of a recap of what I what I just said. Um, in the last three four years, um, downsizers have struggled to buy their new home because guess what? They are struggling uh, competing with those first time home buyers. Um, they also you know as 29 kicked in more sellers coming into the market because they, they thought there was going to be some economic uncertainty coming down the line. At the same time, we've got a static number of buyers in the market. So potentially a little bit easier for sellers to sell because they can move into, they can buy a home in, in for example, Arlington. Um, more sellers looking to sell, but a flat number of buyers. And so we saw the market in Arlington tending away from very much a, a strong seller's market into a more balanced market realistically where we'd like to be a balance between buyers and sellers kind of you know, a better market in that respect we were predicting clearly that the economic uncertainty would kick in we still have we still have an election coming up in november kind of forgotten about that for the time being but it's it's coming back um we can be sure the presidential race will will kick off in full steam not not too, too distant future so that brings the uncertainty with it too mortgage rates are remaining static they're really not an issue and so we saw price appreciation slowing um, throughout 2020. So that was kind of where we saw the predictions for um, earlier in the year. Earlier in the year. Before the pandemic Before. hit. So now what's happening with the market with regard um, to the pandemic and the economic predictions as well? So Right. So the first thing is everybody wants to know is when are we going to return to normal? Hard to tell, I have to say, having looked at the numbers and kind of dragged the numbers out of that dashboard they produce every day to kind of see where we're going. It seems that we are slowly but surely tending downwards. The, the orange bar here is the number of confirmed cases. The, the very wild and erratic gray one is actually the number of tests, would you believe? Mm -hmm. I thought that was supposed to rise and stay at that high, high level, but clearly not. Um, so we are seeing that beginning to flatten. Uh, that number of confirmed cases. Um, the one which I guess scares most people, of course, is of course the death rate. This is what this one is. We'll move on quickly. This is tending downwards. There's a very clear trend of it. But it's important down. to mention why you haven't got up to date information in there. You're about two or three days. Yeah, behind. I like I like to go at least 48 hours behind because the data that the state provides, they always update it, and the, the 24 to 48 hour numbers um, are, are, are usually way lower than they should be. You know, they might be 60 and then the next day they will raise that to about a 90. Um, so I usually wait a couple of days before I put a, kind of put those numbers in, which is why we're back to about maybe the third or fourth there, mm -hmm. I think, which is why that's done. So, but it does seem to, to us anyway that um, we are getting back to a much more normal, uh, getting slowly but surely to a more normal situation. Everything seems to be trending down. The um, shutdown, the lock, the lockdown, shutdown? Shelter in place. Shelter in place, thank you. Um, advisory. Advisory, of course. I'm thinking <laughs> of the UK. So I'm from the UK, so I'm thinking of what they've got. Yeah. They've got a lockdown in the UK. Um, that's being lifted at the middle of the month. Um, for what it's worth, I can't imagine that they will continue with that. Um, it doesn't seem to be having a dramatic impact on certainly on the numbers I just showed you. So I think it's fair to say that will be lifted. Um, and to some extent, people are already making that call, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, that in a minute. So Because this is all, all to do with buyer confidence. Right. Yeah. Um, so quick recap in terms of real estate seasons. Um, these is the listing data for 2019. You can see the spring and fall market. Um, that's it is there. We would have expected a very similar um, uh, shape to that graph 
in 2020, perhaps with slightly more homes coming on the market in that February time frame, just because we had a very mild winter. So let's get some real numbers here. The blue is, in fact, what you just saw, which was the uh, the 2019 uh, listings. Um, now, the orange is the 2020 numbers, the real numbers that we have uh, to date. Um, as you can see, um, in January and February, they tended to be higher than they were in 2019. Um, mild winter. Some were due yeah. to that mild winter, yeah. undoubtedly. Um, I broke March into two because we had the, the it hit uh, in kind of mid-March, at least it became people began to, to feel uh, that it was here in mid-March. So as you can see in early March, first two weeks of March, about tracking about the same as 2020, 19 and 20 were the same. As we got to that second week in March, as you can see, a lot less listings came on the market than did 12 months ago. That continued into April. I don't have any May data yet. It's just the 6th of May today. Um, middle of the month, I'll probably do an update. Um, but looking at the number of properties that are coming on, I think it's fair to say it will be a low number. So let me throw now my crystal ball into... Well, it's also important to note while we're on this screen that um, April, May and June last year tracked at probably 40, 45 homes coming on the market each of those months. And you can see in April, we probably only had 14 homes come on the market that month. So we're yep. already 30, 30 less than where it was last year just right. for April. Yep. I should explain this is uh, Arlington single family. I just did single mm -hmm. family. Um, I didn't want to kind of confuse it by adding more in there, but Arlington single family, and that's kind of you know, one to look at. Um, so let's get the crystal ball out and see what we predict for the future. Um, January through uh, April, clearly have real numbers. Um, we predict again um, a low number of listings in May. Um, we'll see if that picks up a little bit at the end of, end of the month. Time will tell. But certainly it'll be a lot lower than we would ordinarily expect. Here's the key though, sellers still have to sell. Um, and so what we predict is the sellers that didn't sell in you know, second half of March, April and May will do one of two things. A small percentage and, and in the projections I used about 15% will probably choose to delay until 2021, excuse me, 2015, 2021. So the delay by 12 months. Um, but many more will not. Um, and so what we will see in that June, July and August is far more homes coming on the market than we would ordinarily expect. Essentially, the excess inventory that couldn't come on in March, April, May will come on in that June, July, August. And, and remember when we showed what happened last year where we were having 45 homes on the market May, June and July, each of those on average, and you look at the numbers of what we anticipate seeing in June and July, that's massive right it's so about we're down about a hundred by the end of March we will be down about 100 listings so an additional 100 listings will need to come on in that relatively short June July August time frame my my projections here show that that's heavily weighted towards June less to July and even less to, to August so kind of spread across those three months with a weighting towards June so that's that's where those numbers come from so that's kind of where we see uh, the number of listings. What that means, of course, is that we're going to have lots and lots of homes on the market. But will there be as many buyers? And we'll talk more about, about the, the buyers uh, in, in a moment. So, oops, sorry, I'm too fast there. Um, so what does the future mean for the economy? Um, it's interesting, um, if I can just skip over to, and I'll show you some uh, information that I was looking at the other day. Um, which shows, do, will this be a U-shaped recession or a V-shaped recession? That is, will we go into the recession and come right back out? Or will it kind of dip into the bottom? Perhaps even, you know, as some people are calling it a W recession, we'll go into that, that, that dip, we'll get a bit of a boost, but guess what? Back will come the virus and we'll go in there again. If, and this is a McKinsey report as well. It is, yes. So. If you look at these models, Everything has to be right. We have to get everything right for us to go in and come straight back out. Um, and I think it's fair to say that we've not done everything right. Um, there's a lot, of un, a lot of discrepancy between what some states are doing and other states are. We've all been through the, the story, the endless stories about the issues that we've been through. And so I think it unlikely will go, will we'll be in this situation, which is in and, and straight out. That does seem unlikely. Um, whether it will be, you know, flat, 
I think that's that's unlikely too. But I think we will see, we will come out, will we be much more of a U-shaped recession, I think it's fair to say. Um, excuse me, there we go. So many different scenarios, you know, um, but I think it, as I see it, given that the service in the United States economy clearly is more service than manufacturing based, about five times as much in services as there are in manufacturing, services has been hit very, very hard. Just think about restaurants. I mean, some, has, some have survived by doing takeout. Many, of course, long term, clearly will not. And so the service economy is going to be hit very badly by, by, by this recession. Many people can work from home, uh, ourselves included. We're actually broadcasting from our dining room right now um, but many people can't I mean not everybody can do that and many small businesses uh, we saw you know a lot of large companies taking advantage of the small business loan and that inevitably will mean that many small businesses simply will not survive um, it's also true that that this this disease is here for the long term Everybody who said that it'll be gone, you know, relatively quickly, the vaccine will be here, you know, in really short order, are quickly told that's not going to be the case. So this really is going to, going to continue, and so this uncertainty will continue longer term. So it's worth, worth remembering that as we kind of think about what the future brings. Um, in terms of, of money, uh, how easy is it to get money? Um, interest rates are low, which is on the, on the positive side. On the negative side, we are seeing um, some banks begin to tighten their lending. More scrutiny of loan to value, higher credit scores required, and so on. So we are actually seeing some uh, lenders begin to becoming somewhat more cautious until they understand what that medium to long term prospect for house prices are. That will kind of, you know, based on that, then it will, uh, will either open up or not, as the case may be, the, 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 the lending situation we find ourselves in. So that's kind of key. Um, in terms of the buyers, um, it's quite interesting. If I uh, I'll give, quickly show you um, this graph, if I may, um, which shows the Dow Jones uh, actually since the beginning of the year. Um, and so what happened in the middle of the uh, February is 21st, as it shows so here, kind of when the drop happened, we had that stock market crash, which actually was before many people were really understanding that the impact of what this, this uh, coronavirus would actually do. Um, what happened in that case, as the stock market declined, so we saw an impact on the higher priced homes, where many of the, the buyers had equity in the stock market, they were going to use that to supplement uh, the equity in their existing homes to buy that next home. And so we saw the situation where many the higher priced homes took a hit back in that middle of February time frame. Um, it wasn't until mid-March, which is about there, um, we're really at the bottom of the stock market, that the full impact of what's going on right now began to hit. And so we saw a much broader impact to the market. So mid-February, buyers of expensive homes began to kind of pull back. We had a number of situations where buyers exited um, because they were uncertain as to which way the stock market was going to go, although I think it was pretty clear it was going down. So I don't know why there was much uncertainty. But And then as we got to mid-March, then we got to the situation where now we there was a much clearer understanding of what the situation was. And so that had a much broader, a much wider impact in terms of what's going on. Um, so there's a stock market crash, shelter in place. Um, and we have a kind of um, couple of things going on here. Um, many buyers beginning to think, you know, be, being somewhat uncertain, both home buyers and investors, as it turns out, becoming somewhat reticent about going coming into the market. Remember, we're talking about mid -March, mid mid to the end of March and sometime into April here. Um, we also saw home inspections coming back with a vengeance, um, with many buyers looking at it uh, as a mechanism to be able to kind of reduce that price, bring that price back a little bit from what they were paying and use the inspection to do that. So they became the horrible things that we remember from a while ago. But I think it's probably important to point uh, point out at this uh, at this point in time that there really wasn't a correlation between when the shelter in place advisory came into play and when the buyers stopped or started slowing down. There wasn't any, any correlation between those because even after the shelter in place um, was enacted, we still had buyers coming out looking um, to buy homes and to make offers on homes and things like this. So that when we talk about that that may have an influence 
well, it has had an influence on when the buyer confidence returns. It's not necessarily associated with when the shelter in place is lifted. Right, related to, but definitely yeah. not a close correlation. Yeah. That, that's for sure. And we're already seeing that. We'll talk more about that in a yeah. minute as we see buyer confidence return and our shelter in place is still 10 days away, more than 10 days away. Yeah. Um, so two different perspectives here, of course, yeah. but it's a little more nuanced on the seller side. Yeah. Um, buyers begin to ask the question, should I put it off till 2021? Because guess what? Prices may be lower then, given that we're heading into an economic downturn. And for sellers, um, it was really interesting because I'd be on a phone call with a seller and they'd sort of say, well, I, I really want to come on the market now because I think prices will be lower in, in 2021. And then an hour later, I'd be on the phone with another seller who says, yeah, no, I think I want to wait until 2021 because I think the prices will be higher. So it was really, really clear there was so much uncertainty as to what was going to happen with the market and with prices and things that the sellers really didn't know which way to go. So, um, so yeah, that uncertainty is sort of out there. I want to do one thing and then I'm going to let, I'm going to, I'm going to be quiet. No, uh, you no, don't I have am. to. No, I am. I bet. I know I'm He's good. using this method to try and convince right. me to not, right. not, not yeah, speak. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not um, going to work. <laughs> uh, we are focused very much on Arlington this evening. Last night we were focused on the Lexington market, but our website has lots and lots of information about 40 plus towns all over um, uh, Greater, uh, Western Massachusetts, you would call it. Um, no, so, not Western Massachusetts. What, no. Greater Boston. I was yeah. Greater, <laughs> that, the word I was looking for was Greater Boston. Over the Greater Boston. I, was, I couldn't remember the word there. Um, so, it's inventory levels, yeah, you're right, that's the Berkshires, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's where we, where we wish yeah. we were. Yeah. Um, so inventory levels I showed you at the beginning, um, that's in there for, for all those towns, here's the yearly home, uh, yearly total sales and so on. So lots of information on our website. Um, uh, uh, if you're interested, not just in the Arlington market, but, but perhaps in another market, mm -hmm. take a look on there and see if the, uh, the market's already there. So with that, let's get back to there we go. So what does selling in 2020 um, look like? We, it, it, it's when we were, this is, a, and I have to sort of say, this is a completely different seminar to what we normally run. We run seminars um, once a month for most of the year. And this is really completely different. Not only are we not meeting in person, we're doing it um, virtually, but the content is completely different. So part of this when we were writing this was, what do people want to know in this sort of scenario with the uncertainty, you know, all of this? And we really came down to it's the when and how. That's really clear. How, when should we um, sell and how should we sell? Um, and then when we looked at it from a buying perspective, what sort of questions would the buyers have? And guess what? It comes back down to when and how. So this is what these next few sections are all about. Oh, he's giving me the driving you seat can drive. now. You can, you can, you can, you can drive. <laughs> so let's talk about the when. We put together um, a graphic because we wanted to sort of show a little bit about how buyer activity has changed. Um, since we since we uh, started the year, now I have to say, because of the um, because of the very mild winter, we actually started bringing homes on the market the last weekend in January because the buyers were out. There weren't many homes on the market. Let's bring homes on the market. So we had really good attention at the open houses. Um, lots and lots of activity at open houses. During that period of time, we still see um, a lot of virtual showings happening and we still see um, private showings happening. Now, one of the things that we um, track for our, our sellers is that we can track how many people are viewing the 3D tour and the video and the, and the floor plans and the sellers can see that in a real time sort of scenario. So we know you know, how many people in a normal market um, would be looking at those virtual assets or those digital assets. It became clear about the middle of, um, well, I'm just trying to think, when was it? It was a couple of weeks before, it was about mid-March, about mid-March, 
we started seeing a drop off in the number of people coming to open houses. Now, the, the shelter in place hadn't come in yet, but we started seeing a, a, a bit of a drop off happening at attendance. But we started seeing our virtual showings increase and also the number of private showings increase. Um, so the buyers were changing how they were getting in to see a home. Um, then late March, um, we, the last homes that we bought on the market um, in this was the last weekend in March. Um, I think we bought four or five homes on that weekend. We hurried to get them on. They were planning on coming on in April, but we hurried to, to get them on before this all finished, uh, before it all sort of started shutting down. And we really still we still saw activity there, but we saw a real reluctance and we weren't we had ceased doing open houses. We even got to the point where um, buyers who were coming to open houses weren't even grabbing a feature sheet booklet, you know, a, a booklet on the home. They really didn't want to touch anything that was in the home that could possibly have been um, exposed to others. But then we got into the beginning of April where people really started hunkering down, if you like. At that point in time, we saw the virtual showings on homes skyrocket, um, absolutely skyrocket off, off the charts. And we still saw private showings happen. Now we didn't see as many private showings happen, but we were still seeing private showings happen and homes going under agreement but it was a lot slower than what it normally was. And where we were, you know, we've been sort of um, discussing, when do we think things will pick up again? When is the buyer confidence going to return? And we attributed that to, uh, you know, weeks ago, we were sort of saying, I think the buyer confidence will start returning when the number of deaths is, is on a downward, a downward, um, a downward track. And that has correlated. I mean, it's not really on a downward track yet, but it has stabilized. The, I think the buyers are sort of starting to feel, okay, this is coming to an end soon. And especially with the conversations that have been happening um, about some of the states starting to lift their um, shelters in place as well, uh, ease the restrictions, we are starting to see buyer activity return. Um, just uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, you made an offer on a home and there were six offers on it. Um, yep. One of the agents in our team made an offer on a home and there were six offers on it. That was a home in Woburn. Um, just a couple of days ago, uh, one of the other agents in our team made an offer on a home and there were 20 offers on it. Guess what? The buyers have returned. Um, they really have. The, the confidence has increased and there's not really many homes on the market at the moment. Or uh, in, in Arlington, it's, it's, it's quite dramatic how few homes there are on the market. But now let's talk about if, if the buyer confidence has, in, has started returning and it's going to continue returning, how do we bring your home on the market? So when we talk about how, there are two types of homes, and I think it's important to, to distinguish between the two types of homes. One is a vacant home. A vacant home is pretty easy, actually. Um, and the other is an occupied home. That's a little bit tougher because you have, um, and, and we'll get into to, to that in a minute, but there are general characteristics for both of those types of homes as to how uh, you know how things are done whether it's virtual whether it's vacant or occupied there's really not going to be any open houses not for the foreseeable future um it's not that we don't want to do them it's just that we don't believe the buyers will come because of their fear of being in a home with other people although i do have to say we did a virtual open house just last weekend um in concord. At home in yep. concord and just as you were turning up, the, the virtual open house was only a half hour, a half, half hour window. And as Marcus arrived, um, there was someone in the driveway wanting to get in to see the home. And as you were leaving, there was someone in the driveway wanting. So. And there may well have been somebody, somebody in the middle because we put a sign on the door to say this is a virtual open house. So yeah. I think that was a good indication that, the, back to the, the, the diagram we showed previously, 
that buyer confidence returning, we were anticipating late May, early June. I think it's fair to say that I would track that back probably by a couple of weeks or more now and say it's kind of mid-May, I think we will begin to see much more buyer confidence coming back in. The weather helps of course, as well, of course. Mm -hmm. I mean, all, it all kind of all, all um, kind of comes into that kind of mid-May when they, they lift the, the shelter in place. Weather becomes good. Um, buyer confidence kind of returns. Yes, we're getting back to normal. Right, let's get back out and start looking for looking at homes. I mean, I, and we're 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 almost there with with the buyers at this point. And I think it's fair to say um, at this point in time that all of this is a changing dynamic, a changing dyma a dynamic, a changing situation. What worked or what was the case two weeks ago or three weeks ago, may, it's not the case now. And what we anticipate now, it may not be the case in two or three weeks. So everything is, is changing on a, a fairly regular basis. And we're pivoting as, as we need to based on what we're seeing in the marketplace. Um, so at the moment, no open houses. Whether that's going to be the case in two weeks' time, maybe it might be the case in two weeks' time. We'll need to sort of see because... Part of it, we've got to be conscious of, of the safety of, of the buyers who are tracking in the home and also the sellers, if the sellers are living there, and also the agent that's there. So there's there's some components there that we need to be responsible for, So um, socially responsible um, with social distancing. Oh, look, I... There we go. <laughs> anyway, as we were saying before, um, physical feature sheets. Um, even mid-March, we were finding buyers just weren't even wanting to touch them. So at the moment, we're not doing physical feature sheets. We do have them available virtually online um, in a few different places. So the buyers still have all of the resources there that we were providing before, just not at the moment. There's no feature, physical feature sheets. The marketing is all virtual. This is where it is absolutely key. Remember with the graph, the, the graphical that we showed before, how the, the digital assets, the viewing of those digital assets, it's going through the roof um, with the number of views of things that we're seeing. Now, luckily, um, luckily, I don't know whether luckily is it, it's, it's um, we've been doing videos and 3D tours for homes and websites for about the last five years. So it's not that we changed on a dime and started doing these because of um, the changing environment. We've been doing them for five years. So it's just it's marketing as usual um, as to, to what we do. And it's it, I might just digress for a minute here and just tell a story um, I'm working with someone at the moment who's interested in a home um, and and she contacted me about three days ago and said, look, I, I, I'm interested in this home, but I don't get a good sense of it with the um, the photos that are online. Can, can I ask the agent whether they have any videos or 3D tours or anything like this? So I went to the agent, no, doesn't have that. And the buyer's response was, you know, uh, I don't think I like the house enough to even just go and risk myself going and having a look at the home or anything like this. So the agent with not having that 3D tour or the video or something like that to give the buyer a better sense of whether they were willing to risk going in to see that home decided that the house wasn't worth them even thinking about. So. That's really, the, I don't know if I even mentioned this to you. It's really quite um, interesting how that, uh, how that plays out. Right. We'll talk more about that in the marketing section yeah. as well. Um, we would recommend to sellers that you complete a seller's disclosure. Now, Massachusetts is a voluntary disclosure state. You don't need to disclose. We probably find in a normal market 50% of our sellers disclose and 50% don't. We would recommend in this market that a seller fills out a seller's disclosure. Now, why? In a normal market, a buyer can get in to see the home during the open house on a Saturday, during the open house on a Sunday, private showing, uh, you know, if they, they want to do a private showing. All of those sorts of things, they can get into the home as many times as they want to see it before they need to, before the buyer needs to think about making an offer. It is tougher in this market for a buyer to actually get in to see a home. So 
if you've got a seller's disclosure, if the seller's filled out a seller's disclosure, that buyer gets a lot more warm and fuzzy um, about the home because they feel like they know more information about the home than they would otherwise. So we think that that, um, that is really important. And the buyer behavior is to view the home virtually. They spend hours looking at the home online and only if the home ticks all of their boxes and they get inspired by the home, will they then make a private showing? Ergo my, my comment with that buyer just a couple of days ago. So it's really, really important. Now we do that for whether it's a vacant home or an occupied home. So let's get into more about what we mean about what's different. Um, it's probably worth, do you want to talk about the fact that that's the five keys? Uh, so when we... Uh, uh, I need a drink. <laughs> The presentation we normally give, we break it down into five key areas, and these are our five keys to maximize your sale price. The first one we've already done, that was smart decisions, uh, that's there. Then we look at preparation, actually preparing the home, um, which then we'll talk a lot more about in, in these in details. The next one is staging, we see that's hugely important, uh, be it vacant or be it actually occupied, staging is important. Marketing used to be a mix of, of traditional marketing and, and digital marketing, now predominantly digital marketing. And really the, the, the last one of these is, is about bringing our team to bear on it. So those are our five keys. That's why in this one we talk about preparation, staging, marketing. Those are yeah. the three uh, three of the five keys that we need. That may change a little bit depending on whether it's vacant or occupied. So and, and and the two different phases of where we are. So we're in the lockdown phase, but it's starting to to move into the um the buyer confidence returning phase. It's in the beginnings, but during um the lockdown. The preparation, if the house needs painting inside or something needs fixing, it's pretty easy because the contractors are quite happy to be in vacant homes. In fact, a lot of contractors are looking for work at the moment. And so if there's a vacant home that they can get into, fantastic. Um, we had uh, had a, a painter who was in a home, a vacant home, and just finished a couple of days ago and we're staging it tomorrow. So it's it's really, because it's vacant, it's easy. The staging, as I just mentioned, we're staging it tomorrow. It's full staging because from a, the perspective of a vacant home, um, no one's in there. So our movers aren't at risk. Our stages aren't at risk. Our photographer's not at risk. The agent's not at risk. It, it's business as usual. Our marketing, as we were mentioned before, our marketing is all vi virtual. So that hasn't changed. And the showings. Um, restricted in that there are some restrictions to the number of people that can be in a home um, at any point in time. Um, we definitely don't um, allow uh, overlapping appointments so you're not going to have a situation where one buyer's agent is showing one group of people and another buyer's agent um, is coming with their group of people at the same time. So there, is, there are restrictions to that. And closing is virtual. The, uh, the the real estate industry has done some amazing things just recently in, in figuring out how to get through the process of closing virtually. Um, things from smoke inspections to attorneys to the mortgage uh, companies, it's all handled virtually these days. Um, so now let's look about during the lockdown with an occupied home. This is where things are a little bit more different and a bit tougher um, because the contractors, they're not really willing to go into an occupied home. Um, you know, you've got a painter, you, you might want to have the home, some, some walls freshened up or something like that. And you know what? The contractors aren't really willing to go in. And as a seller, are you willing to have some strangers come into your home and potentially put you at risk? So there's there's a few more challenges with that. Staging. Um, we have limited our staging of an occupied home to soft furnishings only. In fact, um, we uh, we delivered soft furnishings to two homes just today. And what we mean by soft furnishings are pillows, throws, rugs, bedding, towels, things like this that there's no real fear of the virus being present and staying on those, um, those, those um, materials. 
um, marketing virtual again. I should put we should put that marketing in the in the general because it's the same for all of them. Anyway, um, we did. <laughs> Okay. Um, showings um, very restricted. Some towns are even preventing homes from being shown if they're occupied. Uh, Somerville, Medford, Winchester. Uh, Winchester. You can't even show those homes if um, if they're occupied. So that's that's a real restriction um, to that. And closing again is uh, virtual. Um, so now let's get into where we believe we're in the beginning of it now of the buyer confidence returning. When it's a vacant home, easy still, contractors are willing to be in the vacant home, still the full staging, still the virtual marketing. <clears throat> the difference here is that showings, they'll be less restricted. It might be fine for multiple groups of, of buyers to be in the home at once. Might even be open houses. Um, they might be the ones that will open up in physical open houses um, sooner than, than anything else. And the closings being virtual. The next one is the buyer confidence returning, as I say, the phase that we're about to start into now when we're talking about occupied homes. So when we talk about this, we need to sort of factor in that we're just starting to get into that phase now. So what we're talking about now is going to be a lot different to what we talk about in three weeks time or four weeks time, which is going to be a lot different to what we're talking about in two months time. So it's progressively going to change. So contractors are going to, we believe contractors are going to progressively be willing to go into homes to do work. Same with the staging components. Um, as things start to ease a little bit, we'll be progressively more willing to fully stage a home. Now, what the difference in, in our soft furnishing staging to our fully staged is, let's say, um, we want to bring in a couple of side tables and a couple of lamps um, because remember we're talking about an occupied home so a, a seller already has furniture in the home. Um, but we might need to move their coffee table and move it to somewhere else and bring in another coffee table. Um, things like this but they're hard surfaces and hard surfaces typically are where they say the virus can exist for up to three days on that. So as things start to ease, that's when we're going to be a little bit more willing to bring furniture in and to move a seller's furniture around um, as we're staging. The marketing's virtual um, and the showings will progressively get less restricted. Part of this, I think, has to do with the seller's confidence level as well. Um, now, we do, even with showings that are happening now, we do require the buyers to come in with masks gloves and we provide booties and we also do provide gloves as well but um, we don't provide masks because they're too hard to, <laughs> too hard to find but most people agents, have their own they, they do. I don't go anywhere without mine okay good <laughs> um, I was at a home today where um, there was a showing um, a buyer's agent came with four buyers you know a, a parents and two smaller children and the agent had the masks she had the the um, the gloves as well, but the buyers also had them. So, you know, everyone's very, very conscious of that these days. So as um, it depends on the seller as to their confidence level, whether they'll be a little bit more comfortable with um, the showings beginning to get less restricted and perhaps even um, physical open houses happening. And again, closings are virtual. So let's just re-show this graph again, or oh, the graph, it's not a graph. Um, graph, it's a graphical. You'll see here that we have this, um, uh, this uh, from going from the lockdown period. to the buyer confidence returning. And I, I have to say, Marcus and I debated this for quite a bit. I and think I it's, uh, no, no I won't because it's already started. <laughs> He didn't believe the buyer confidence would start returning until about mid-May or so. And I'm saying, mm, no, I think it's going to be the beginning of May. And guess what? I won't. Uh, but it is still, if you look at this, you know, it is, start, we're at this point now where the, buy, the pri uh, private showings are increasing and this is the beginning of May that this has happened. But 
from the perspective of, of what we talked about, let's put it into a summary form. So here we're in the lockdown phase, which is where we are today. Um, and we're a vacant and occupied homes. Now, what I should point out is the difference in a vacant, a vacant home, the difference from a lockdown phase to a buyer confidence phase Everything's the same except showings might be a little bit less restricted once the bioconfidence returns and things start easing. When you look at the, the lockdown phase, the difference between a vacant home and an occupied home, you can again see that when, the, when it's occupied, it's a lot more of a challenge um, from the preparation perspective, from the staging perspective, and from the showings perspective. And then as we get into the bioconfidence, it's moving and becoming more progressive um, over time. So that we thought that that um, is important to just show the summary of that. Now, when you look at um, when you look at the bioconfidence returning, what does that mean? So you have to think about it from the perspective that when the bioconfidence returns. No, let me put it this way. A lot of sellers, a lot of listing agents maybe sell one house a year, bring a home on the market um, one, one, one a year. They're not actually going to know when the buyer confidence is going um, to return until they start seeing a lot of homes coming on the market. And then they'll sort of think, okay, yeah, things are improving. Now, if they're working with buyers, they might see that their buyers are starting to return. But what we believe is going to happen, which is one of the predictions um, we talked about before, by the time we get to the end of May, we're potentially going to see something like an excess of 100 homes that want to sell this year that haven't been able to come on the market. So we anticipate June and July are going to have a large number um, of homes coming on the market. So what does that mean? So if you're a seller and you come on the market in June and July, it's going to be an awful lot of other sellers on the market at that point in time with potentially less buyers. Because when we talk about the buyers, we also have to factor that in Arlington, we're talking about a lot of first time home buyers. We're talking about um, maybe a second home buyer or a buyer going from a, a, a condo into a single family. Um, we're talking about people at the beginning of their career as well. And they're potentially, you know, some of those folks may have lost their jobs. Um, some of those folks might be working from home, so they're, they're fine. But there's potentially going to be fewer buyers in the market because even if a person has kept their job, they may be worried about, as Marcus was describing before, the U-shaped recession. Maybe it's a W-shaped recession. Um, and they might have their job now, but what if in two months' time they lose their job then? So we are going to, we believe we're going to see fewer buyers in the market and a lot more homes coming on the market because those sellers who were planning on coming this on this year are going to come on this year. So when you've got a whole lot of homes coming on the market, what's important? How are you going to make your home stand out from everyone else? It's fair to say that the digital assets that um, uh, that are in there is is absolutely key in this particular period of time. Um, it's critical for the rest of the time, but it's even more so critical um, now. But when you talk about um, smart decisions, let's let's talk about the five keys for a minute. Smart decisions. When should you come on soon? Um, don't wait until June or July. Or if you do come on in June and July, make sure you've got all of the other components into, into play so that you can stand out from everyone else. Um, part of it's the preparation, so, uh, part of it's preparation. Making your home feel and appeal to the buyers who come in to see it or who are looking at it digitally. That's important. The buyers 
don't want to, to buy a home that needs a whole lot of work. They would like to have a home that they can just move into, settle down and get through the next um, 12 months without really having to do too much work. Staging is really, really important because it's all about um, to grab the attention of the buyers. It's when the buyer first walks in the door, it's that visceral feel as they walk in the door. That's absolutely key. Staging. Um, you know, even if it's a vacant home, don't leave it empty. Stage that it needs to be staged so that buyers can imagine themselves living in the home and living in this home looking really, really awesome. The marketing, 3D tours, videos, websites. We'll talk about this a little bit later, but that's going to make your home stand out from everything else and be the determining factor as to whether a buyer will even make a private appointment, a private showing of your home. And then the excellence through teamwork, and we'll get into that in a little bit, but they're key in this particular market that's coming up, even in the markets and, uh, you know, the last few years, it's really, really important, but even more so in this particular uh, market coming. So what does preparation services um, involve? So we still do this. Um, preparation services, we might just do it virtually. Um, we, I was working with someone just uh, a week ago um, who took me around their home with me on the phone and we did a FaceTime. So I got to see the home, gave some advice on this and gave some advice on that. No, you don't need to do this. Um, yes, if we did this, if you did some paint, um, those sorts of things, that will give you the highest return on investment. Don't worry about doing that because the buyers are not going to pay any more money if your home has that um, than what it would cost. For instance, we're not. I'm not going to. We're not going to suggest something that might cost two thousand dollars to do and it'll get you a $2,000 increase in price. That just doesn't make sense. That's just busy work. But we might suggest something that may case the cost $5,000 to do, but it might get you a an, an, um, $50,000 increase. It, it, it depends. Um, but we can still do that virtually. We don't physically need to go into your home to do that. Now, the level of assistance, um, it really depends on how, uh, at what phase we are in this coming back to, to normal um, phase. But we can send you a list of contractors. Um, you might need a painter. We can send you a, a, a few painters who are really responsive and reasonably priced and, and get busy and do it or we can help you organize them to come and see to give a quote. We can walk around the home with the contractor or with you on the phone with the the, um, the contractor and they can give you a quote just seeing your home by the phone. We can also help oversee the project, um, you know, in conjunction with you. So the preparation services, um, you know, it can still happen even in today's uh, today's environment. Although I have to say, if it's an occupied home, as we talked about before, if it's occupied, it's a little bit more of a challenge. The key difference too, though, is that it's it's very much what the the seller wants. If the yeah. seller wants a lot of assistance, Absolutely. then we can do that. If the seller doesn't want, feels confident enough to yeah. be able to organize the contractors themselves, yeah. but give me some recommendations. We can accommodate that too. So it's yeah. driven, sure, it's driven by the market we're in, that will change. Yeah. But we, even without that, it really is very much up to the, the seller to decide how much assistance they want. And uh, whichever, whichever way they want to run the project, then we can run that project that way. Yeah. That's the key. Absolutely. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, here's an example of a home. Um, you can see the difference between the before and the after where the wallpaper came down um, and just fresh paint on the walls and the floors were refinished. This made a dramatic difference in the home because remember, well, we didn't do anything else to this home apart from paint. Um, so the home was still dated. It still had a dated kitchen, a dated bathrooms. It was still, you know, it, it needed work. But with fresh paint, oh, oh, the buyers felt, oh, we can just move into this home. It's a lot different to a buyer walking into a home with wallpaper on the walls and, and the floors needing refinishing and sort of the, oh, I've got to do, I've got to spend money and I've got to do work on this. 
Um, here's another home. This particular home um, came on the market with a different agent um, and didn't sell. It was on the market for about three or four months, didn't sell. Um, they got me in to talk about the home and I suggested that they should paint the kitchen cabinets. Now, why? Um, so the wood cabinets tend to date a home. Um, not many buyers would, if they had a choice between wood cabinet kitchen and white painted cabinet kitchen, they will absolutely go with the white painted cabinet kitchen every single time. Because if you remember, a lot of builders are building new construction with white, white kitchens. Um, so a buyer feels when it's white, the buyer feels that, oh, this is a renovated kitchen. This is, this is really good. So anyway, the story about this home, it was on the market for about three months with a different agent not selling. Um, we came in and just got them to paint the, the kitchen. We actually got them to paint one of the bathroom vanities as well. And we had competing offers on the home. So that's the difference um, that happens. Um, the next one, a lot of folks don't realize that um, this, the, the tile, um, you know, whether you're talking about green tile, purple tile, blue tile, um, you know, with the black stripes across the top of it and things, they paint up beautifully because this is those same tiles painted. Now, the wallpaper came down and we just painted an off colour, but we didn't do anything else to this bathroom apart from paint. Um, because this particular bathroom, if a buyer walked into that, mm, we've got to spend a lot of money. We've got to spend a lot of money doing this house. Oh. Um, and it turns them off a little bit. Even though nothing has changed, if a buyer walks into this bathroom, it's fresh, it's clean, and they think, yeah, we can, we can move in like this and we'll worry about upgrading the bathroom in, in a few years' time. So that makes a huge difference. Now, that was just a quick primer on preparation. Now we get into staging services. Now, so, so we, we mentioned um, our dog who's not with us at the no, moment. Don't know where he is. is. Um, but he if you smell food, that's what it is. Yeah. If you see our truck um, uh, driving around, um, that's the dog, um, and there's the dog there. <laughs> um, and these are the agents and um, our full-time uh, support folks as well in the team. Um, and our staging services, well, what does that mean in this particular environment? We can still do virtual consultations. Um, we, uh, we've done a couple of those in the last week um, where, again, as we mentioned before, we go around with the phone, or FaceTime, um, or a seller will send us a video of the home um, and, and we'll come up with a, a plan. Even if we're in this period of time where it's soft furnishings only, um, we can, you know, even just depersonalizing and decluttering makes a huge difference. It makes a huge difference. Um, it's done by our in-house um, professional staging team. Um, we have a full-time staging coordinator. We've got part-time um, professional stagers. You saw our truck. Um, and the staging depends on each particular home because if it's a vacant home, we'll bring in a whole house full of furniture. If it's an occupied home, we'll bring in the accessories or the components based on, on need. Um, you know, if someone's dining, we had a situation earlier on, the, uh, earlier on this year where a seller's dining room table was, uh, one of the legs was broken and they said, well, I'm gonna to be tossing that. We said, well, get rid of it now. We'll bring in a dining room table. So it, you know, each home is different um, based on the particular needs. As I mentioned, we'll progressively be lifting restrictions on staging occupied homes. What we are seeing some of our sellers do is some sellers have a second home or they have a friend that's um, moved, has a second home and they're not living in one of those homes. So for the period of time that the home's on the market in that very, well, we should explain, when a home first comes on the market, we'll have four or five, the first four or five days, 
there'll be a large concentration of showings or activity at the home. So if a seller's not in that home at that particular time, we will then market the home as being um, the seller has temporarily moved out to allow for safer showings for buyers. And the buyers are responding to that um, uh, very much so. So we do, it, it is better if we can get the seller to move out just for that period of time that the home's on the market um, in the first few days. Can I ask a question uh, about <clears throat> virtual consultation? Yes. So you do the, the, the seller goes around with a, with a FaceTime, uh, our staging coordinator, does our staging coordinator then provide them with? Yes, you know the answer to this. That's good, and that's good. I, I didn't. I didn't. You could have just jumped in. He doesn't like jumping in. No. Um, so there was a reason I asked. Because <laughs> I didn't. A, I didn't. Right. How um, does that work? I mean, I think it's important to understand how yeah. that actually works. So the virtual so. consultation, the the staging coordinator will talk to the seller while she's going while they're going around the home and talking about the different things that are in the home because sometimes it might be just that there's too much furniture in a room let's move a console table from in this room into this room where there's less furniture or um you know <laughs> different components but when so the the staging coordinator will talk about that when they're on the phone with the seller and then after they've gotten off the phone, the staging coordinator will send um, a summary, a, a summary email describing room by room what they talked about as well. So is that what you were talking about? Ah, to get? that's how it ah, works. <laughs> okay. He's smart, Alec. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we we get these questions quite a bit about how well what does that look like? So as I sort of say. We, this is a, a changing and an iterative process, but here's something that we put together. Actually, we have a seller who's um, moving out of a home on Friday of this week, and then we're going in on staging uh, on Monday to go and stage it and then bring it on the market next week. So this is, is, is what um, is actually happening at the moment. And it depends on what the seller's how they feel about that, whether that um, is going to work for them or not. Um, but basically, because one of the, the reasons that we do, if we're, if we're bringing in hard furnishings, again, the differenti uh, differentiation is between the soft furnishings and the hard furnishings. Um, if a seller needs hard furnishings, we really do need, um, at the moment, we do need them to move out for a couple of days before we come in. Um, but you know, this is there's been a fair bit of thought behind how we can make this work for people. So we have a plan. We have a plan. Good point. We have, we have a, a plan. plan. Which you can see is quite a lot to the plan, but there is a plan. No matter what the situation you're in, you know, when you can move out, where you're moving, if you can't, there's a plan. Yeah, there's, there's a, a whole plan. series of these. This is just one representative one. We have a whole series of ones that, yes. yeah, this is more like it, and then we kind of tweak it as in, the, in the situation that we find ourselves in. And it's really important. Staging is so important. Here's um, a photo where this, this photo here was a listing photo when another agent bought the home on the market, and the home didn't sell, didn't sell, didn't sell. Because when buyers walk in a door and a home hasn't got furniture in it, often they don't know how they would use a room. So furniture helps people define how they could use a room and also has the buyers thinking, oh, I'd like to live like this. Maybe if I buy this house, I will live like this. Um, but anyway, so this home didn't have any, uh, any, any staging in it. It didn't sell, didn't sell, didn't sell, was on the market for quite a while. We came in and bought staging furniture in and we had competing offers for the home. So um, it, it, it makes a huge difference. Here's another one where this is an interesting story in that um, the home had been a for sale by owner for about six months. Then another agent had bought it on for 12 months. Um, then and it didn't sell. Then the seller tried for sale by owner again for another six months. It didn't sell. They called us in um, and we came in and staged the whole home because the seller had moved out um, well in, in advance. But if you have a look at this, 
when you hear or when you see a description for a home that says a unique floor plan, that's not necessarily a good thing for a, for a buyer to, 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 um, to hear or to see because they don't know how to use the home. If you can see here, we've got three types of rooms. Here, you've got a living room. You've got a dining room here with the, the chandelier. And then you've got another room here. Well, the buyers would have walked through this and sort of said, hmm, what do we use this room for? And it was just too puzzling. They couldn't figure that out. So when we came in and staged it, what you can't see here, but this is the, the living room in the front of the house. And here's the dining room um, is in the, the second part of the house. And we staged this as a pre or post dinner drinks room um, with a bar set up and, um, and the implications that before or after dinner, here's where you sit with your guests and you have a drink afterwards. So, oh, and I, uh, did I say that it didn't sell and then when we bought it on the market, it we had sell. competing offers? Yeah, I, I couldn't remember whether we talked. So staging, hugely important. Um, but during the lockdown phase, it's really soft furnishings only. But as we're beginning to get it with a vacant home, we're fully staging period. Um, but with this, uh, the, the, the lockdown starting to ease, we'll be starting to um, do more and more physical staging um, as we go along. So now, Marcus. Finally. Yeah, <laughs> finally. Finally, yeah, finally. Yeah, okay, yeah, here we go. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, okay. yeah. Now the really interesting <laughs> stuff. Um, marketing, um, but not really marketing anymore, really digital marketing. Everything has, has moved away from the traditional print marketing to some extent. There is still some print marketing. We are still doing newspaper advertising, for example. But most of the, the, the marketing that we do now when we think about listing a home on home is all digital, I mean, including this, for example, you know, given that this is um, uh, all you know, virtual as opposed to in person. So um, lots of components to marketing, and I'll go through them. I want to tee some things up here, actually. It occurred to me that I didn't tee some things up. Oh. See, I should have. I will now, though. There we go. All teed up. Um, <laughs> photographs, no surprise. You could have let me talk while you were teeing it up. I would have, but anyway, keep going. I no, would have distracted you. So, <laughs> um, so photographs still matter. No, you know, clearly they still matter. Um, on Monday, I did a uh, Martini Monday where I looked at virtual everything, and we showed good photographs, but there are an awful lot of very bad photographs out there. And when you think about this market, that that everybody is viewing things digitally first, they're not going to see a home just to see what it looks like. They're looking at everything digitally first. If you've got a poor set of photographs, it's highly likely, just the example that, that Danny gave you know, just 10 minutes ago, it's highly likely that a buyer won't even bother going into the home. I don't want to put myself at risk to go into this home because look at the photographs, it looks a really poor home. So photographs really, really matter. They always have, but if they can matter any more, they make it matters even more today. I mean that that's key. So you really got to have a you know a, a, a great set of photographs, professional photographs. And essentially, that's all it is. Video. Um, if you think about the the way people search for things today, um, the number two search engine is YouTube. Um, when you go into do a Google search. Right underneath the couple of search results come the YouTube videos that correspond to it. So video is everything. It's really powerful. It has some drawbacks. And the primary drawback it has is that it's we, di we, we direct traffic. We direct the flow through the home. Now, we tried to do that in a way that makes sense and how a user would walk through that home, clearly. But it's still we're the directors. We'll talk a little bit more about how we can put the buyers in that kind of director role. But for now, it really is um, uh, a, a kind of directed way through. But it does give a flow, of, gives a sense of the flow of the home. Photographs are, are just a set of photographs, always in, in, the, in, in an order that makes sense to show them. But it doesn't give the flow of the home. And so the video very much does that. And I want to kind of give you a sense of what some of that looked like. Um, This was actually a home in uh, in Arnton on Candia. We sold in February this year, I think. We bought it. I was just looking right. up. Um, we bought it on the market the 27th of Feb. 
Right. Um, so before things really, well, this was after the, the stock market crash, um, but before things had really started uh, becoming a, a huge issue. So you can see it kind of does give you that flow as you go through the home. And it's key that, that, that it does that, which you can't really get with, with photographs. Um, what a video is not, it's like I said on Monday, it is not a series of photos stitched together because that's that's a slideshow. I'm sorry, it's not a video. Um, a video needs to give you that sense, give those sweeping uh, view of the home, kind of pans of, of rooms mm -hmm. to see how one room feeds into another. It's not a series of, of uh, videos stitched together. But video has other purposes too. Um, we do lifestyle videos for some of our homes that really take a, a, a home and put you in it. This works very well for very large homes, which many times a prospective buyer will go in and kind of can't quite envisage themselves in the home. Um, even though we've, we've staged it, it looks beautiful, but they just can't see themselves in the home. And so the lifestyle video kind of puts real people. We put actors into the video. It kind of say, ah, oh, right, now I understand how we would use these spaces. Give them, I guess, inspiration is probably the right word. Inspires them to think, yes, this is how this can be used. Imagine living your life here. There you go. That's right. <laughs> Hence that's the, the series. The, the that's the series. So. That's the series. Um, so directed view through the home, a lifestyle video, and then social media is really important to us uh, in terms of how we advertise the home. And so what we need to do is create video, video content that works well on social media. And so let me give you an example of, of just that, what works on social media. So as you can see, our dog is, he started pointing point at me human because he wouldn't go in the room if I didn't punch him. So we had to do that. <laughs> um, but you know, the idea here, cute as it, as it is, what we're really trying to do is get that kind of content that works really, really well on social media. And if I can and skip gets engagement. Right, and get if I can skip forward to find out where he runs, and probably right at the end, he runs outside. Here he goes. You know, this kind of it, it showcases the home. In this case, it show showcases the size of the back garden. This is a home in, in Concord we have on the market right now. But it really does, it's kind of key to mm -hmm. back in. It's key to getting it out on social media, getting that engagement on social media, is that what you called it? Yep. Engagement on social media, and that's what kind of gets people interested in the home. Um, that's kind of key. So video is, is very, very powerful in a number of different ways in terms of being able to show the, uh, showcase the, the home. So I talked about the video, first of all, as being very much, we direct the, we're, we're the directors, if you will. Wouldn't it be nice if we could put the buyer in that role? And we can actually do that with 3D tours. Um, so I'll use the same uh, home that you saw a video of. Let's go back and show you this. There we go. Um, so this is uh, the very same home, but this time I'm going to decide what which way I walk around this home. Um, maybe I want to go to the uh, there. I want to look at how, how how sweeping that is through to the dining room. I can go upstairs in a minute. This takes me through into the the dining room is a sunny day, as you can see. Yeah. Um, here's the kitchen. Now I'm directing. If I want to see, you know. If you want to turn around at this point in time. If I want to turn around at that time. Oh, yeah. That must be the bedroom. If I want to see about those tiles, let me kind of move forward a little bit. and Let me have a look at those tiles. I can kind of do that. All oh, right. Yeah. Now, if I have any questions about the home, I can find that out. I can go down to the basement if I want. I can go upstairs if I want. I'm in control. I, the prospective buyer, are in control. And this is a great way to get people interested in that home. And, you know, prior to where we were, it was a great tool to be able to um, ensure people who really didn't have that much opportunity to see the home stayed in the transaction. Because at two in the morning when they're beginning to think, how big was that, that closet? I don't really remember. All of those kind of questions that a buyer would have, this would answer those questions. Now, if you come forward to where we are today, they really haven't had that much opportunity to be in the home. So it's, it's a much worse situation than, than they were in previously. This is a great tool for them to essentially be in that home. They really get a feel of how the home hangs together 
And do I want to go and see this in person? Oh, yeah, I want to go and see this home in person. So it's right. absolutely critical. So, so 3D tours prior to where we are was often used after the fact. Today it's being used before and people and prospective buyers are making a, a decision about whether to go and physically view this home based on what they see through through the 3D tour and the video. That's and if key. there's only photos on a home, you know, of a home, you lack it the floor, may right? not it may not even get those private showings. So, and the more private showings you get of a home, the higher the price goes. Right. So I mean, that's that's, that's just, key because as, a, as as you can see. Video and 3D tour gives you the flow of the home. Photographs gives you a set of snapshots. And they're, they're totally different yeah. uh, in terms of their, their effectiveness. When, remember, the buyers are making a decision about whether to go and view that home based mm -hmm. on what they see here today. And that's slightly different to what we've seen previously. Danny always likes to show the dollhouse for you. Yeah, there dollhouse view. You, you like great. the dollhouse view. Yeah, but this gives you a good sense of what room, uh, what rooms hang on top of the others, and you know what's below, what's above. Um, you know, if you've got a one and a half bathroom home, and you really want two full bathrooms, you'll get a good sense of whether you could expand the the bathroom or whether a bathroom can go in a different. You can add a completely new bathroom. Um, it, it's it's huge being able to do that. And then guess what? If you can do all of that, then clearly doing a floor plan, just as easy too. This is the first floor, this is the main entrance that we showed, here's the, here's the, uh, the family room and so on. Living so um, you can get a, re a real sense of, of that home from that floor of plan. Scale. Right, and it's a floor plan that's got furniture in it. So you can see, you can actually measure it. You can hit the tool down here and you can actually measure your way to see how big big the, the rooms are. So that's, that's really important too. Yeah. So having put that together, and you'll excuse me if I'll jump all the way to the top. Um, we should mention, we should mention um, 45 Candia. It came on the 27th of February, um, which was, again, that was after the stock market crashed. We showed you before how severely the stock market crashed. This time, I guess you've sort of seen, it was a cream puff. It was the preparation had been done, the staging had been done, all of the digital assets. It came on the market for eight hundred thousand dollars, which was, a, you know, a realistic price for the home. But we had so many people looking at that home, um, and we had eighteen offers on the home. And you can see it closed for nine hundred and fifty-eight, which I think is a hundred and twenty percent of twenty. You told me the other one hundred and twenty of um, yep. the asking price. So it it makes a difference. It makes a difference. So I've got photographs. I've got uh, feature sheets. I'll show you those in a minute. I've got 3D tours. I've got video. I've got everything about the home. Now I need to give the prospective buyer a single place to go find all that information. And that's where the single property website comes in. Um, it really needs to, to, to kick all of those, those um, facets of the, of the marketing and put it in one single location so people can see what's going on. So here's this is the, the website for 45 Candia. Um, as you can see, clearly we need to explain how big it is, um, you know, what the school districts are, the kind of basic information about the home. But here now we're trying to set the scene with the narrative and then the photographs within that. So here's the narrative about the home. Go down on, you know, and here are the photographs that you can page through. Again, we're, 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 all, we're giving that, that prospective buyer a lot more color, if you will, to what it's like to live in that home, how, how everything flows, as well as professional photography, that, that clearly matters. So we're kind of walking them through the home. And it's important that everything kind of does give them the sense of what it's like to live in that home, the flow of, of the home, essentially. So there's the home. Guess what? There's the 3D tour. We saw the video previously. Um, we also do another video, another one for social media in this case. Top five reasons I love this home. So that's there as well. Talked about the property brochure. Um, we no longer print those property brochures. We found that uh, buyers were unwilling to pick them up. They weren't sure where they had been essentially. Uh, but here we are. And whose grubby and hands whose had grubby been hands. on them? Not very many, just as, <laughs> just as in the printer really. But anyway. Um, but now we take that brochure that we would have handed them in person and now we put it all online. So here's the brochure. They can look at it just like they can in an ebook. Here's the floor plans, for example, um, photographs of the home, information about Arlington, 
information about where the home is in relation to uh, to the schools and the the uh, um, or the the um, features of the town, but that's the wrong word. Facilities, Components. facilities <laughs> of the town. Yeah. Um, that's all there, and then you know the the, the website and so on. So everything there really in, that they would expect to pick up. Uh, at a brochure and then we you know to finish it off just some maps in terms of where mm -hmm. that house is in relation to public transport hugely important in Arlington as well as the schools which is hugely important in in a large number of towns so that's kind of wraps up that kind of single marketing the, the marketing piece of that in a single property website I should point out that I I do go over this way for a little bit it's not me ignoring what's going on I'm just going to see attention to what I'm saying. if there's questions oh okay, okay. I thought you just <laughs> So you heard it all, so be, you heard it all before. What am I doing? Oh, you heard it all before, yeah. no. So we've got all that in place. Now we need to get it out in front of uh, of prospective buyers. And we two primary mechanisms, three primary mechanisms. The first mechanism, of course, is goes on the multiple listing service and Zillow and Trulia and 101 other uh, websites. But in terms of the marketing component of this, we two basic uh, trends that we follow or two uh, strategies we follow. The first one is a broad strategy uh, and then a very targeted strategy. So two things. Um, in terms of the broad strategy, um, it's all around social media. Um, broad in terms of Zillow and Trulia and that, that's, kind of, that's a given. Every, every home that comes in the multiple listing service has that. But now we want to get this home in front of people who, who potentially want to buy this home um, or know somebody who potentially wants to buy this home. And so we do a large uh, amount of social media marketing, uh, coming soon, just listed, uh, home of the week, and so on. So every week we'll be pushing out multiple social media adverts out to uh, out there. Key thing about those, those adverts, of course, is if your photographs are not of the highest quality, they are simply not going to be looked at. They're going to scoot past on somebody's uh, newsfeed, yep. um, and you, they're just not going to take notes. So you've got to have everything in place. When they click on one of those adverts, guess what? It takes them to the website. So you really do have to have everything in place and everything integrated. And that's the real power of social media marketing, pushing it out broadly, but allowing them then to come back to the uh, those assets that I just showed you just two minutes ago. Because it's important to mention that people don't go onto Facebook or Instagram to search for a home. They just don't. But in general, people who are searching for a home are on Facebook and Instagram. So if they see a home come through in the newsfeed and, ooh, ooh, uh, it's, it's huge, um, really important. So that's broad. Now let's go narrow. Um, Broad, broad. I should, should clarify that. Broad in terms of geographical means an area, you know, within three to five miles around yeah. Arlington. I don't mean Arizona Los Angeles or whatever. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Our children in California do not need to see it. Right? <laughs> uh, that doesn't make any sense. Um, but you know, broad, but still relatively you know, confined geographically. Um, in terms of now narrow, um, we need to get that that information about that home in front of people who we know. Um, based on what they've done previously uh, in terms of, for example, perhaps they come to an open house. Well, I'll pick the example of Candia and they came to a Candia open house. We bring another home on the market that's very similar. Clearly, we need to be telling that person, that, that the people who came to the Candia open house, hey, you were very interested in Candia. You didn't you didn't uh, win win that one because it's sold for so, for so many offers. That we have another one coming on the market. So it's really important that we're now very targeted mm -hmm. based on people that we know would be interested in that home. So we spend that a lot of time. That are looking in that town, right. in that price range. Town, that price type range, of thing. that kind of We're not thing. just going to spam people. Um, no, would they do that? No, we're not going to spam people. But if they came they to don't. an open house priced at such and such in this town and we have another home coming on the market right. in that town. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a no-brainer that we uh, we target, email them and let right. them know about the home. So that's really the, the marketing component. I mean, everything today is digital, is virtual, whichever word you prefer. Um, we've been doing, with the, with the exception of putting our brochures on the multiple listing service, everything you've seen there. And online. Yeah. Um, we, were, we were doing... Um, back in February we've been doing for an awful long time. So nothing really changed in terms of what we're doing. We're just seeing an awful lot of more engagement in terms of uh, of the website 
um, of those 3D tours, of the social media posts, a lot more engagement on those than we've seen previously. So huge, that's, that's key. That's huge key. compared to what was going on. So we probably should talk. Um, this hasn't changed, so we just we we're not going to spend any time on this. Excellence through teamwork. Um, to us, our seller is the centre of our universe. Um, you know, we have a team. We have people in the team who's have their different roles to make sure that we market a home and bring it on the market with as little stress as possible to a seller. So, you know, we have the staging coordinator, we have our marketing coordinator, we have our listing coordinator, we have a preparation services, we've got a closing coordinator, the agent, but the whole focus of everything we do is our clients, is our sellers. So that's uh, nothing has changed with that, but we thought we should mention that because that's important to making sure that a home it sells for the highest price. And especially in this market where you've got to stand out from every other home that's going to be coming on the market because they are. there's a lot of homes going to be coming on the market um, this year. So we've spent way too long talking about sellers. Yeah, but... Let's talk about buyers. Yeah. Um, I should add that th there's just a, a, a few things to talk about buyers because um, we are tomorrow evening. This is the four nights in a drop we've been live streaming. Um, it'll wear the equipment out in the end. Um, we are doing a... We're tech driven, you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> we are doing a buyer seminar. Myself and Corinne uh, Shippard uh, on the MA Pops team um, are going to be doing a buyer seminar same same time, same back channel tomorrow evening. Yeah, same three places, um, right. Facebook, YouTube and Twitch, right. which I'm, is where we're streaming to now. Right, I'm just going to swap Danny out, who's next yeah. to me, for Corinne, who's in Arlington. So. I'll, I'll have a martini while there we you're go. doing that it. That works for me, we can do that too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about buying in 2020, kind of overview. If you, if you want to know the details of buying, um, we're really going to cover that uh, tomorrow evening uh, in that buyer seminar. As well. As well. So when we've done this one before, um, you know, we're moving out of this kind of phase where nobody could really do anything into one where we see buyer confidence very much returning. So the when is pretty clear. We've been through that a, a lot. So let's talk a little bit about the how. First of all, things are becoming a little different in for specifically in terms of buyers. And, and we'll talk about showings and inspections and things like that. First one is around showings, restricted showings. Um, we even got to the point where we still are to some extent, it will be lifting very soon, I'm sure, um, that towns were restricting, uh, were disallowing, preventing, me, preventing yeah. Um, yeah. occupied homes being viewed. Somerville uh, pre um, prevented homes that were in multifamily units, so, uh, so an apartment block, for example. Um, you couldn't show a home in that in that apartment block because there was a common area. So mm. there were many restrictions. and. Um, and that, at that time, if you can't view the home, then clearly you have to do everything. This is where our marketing strategy comes in. You have to do everything yeah. virtually. And, and I think buyers buying a home based on a few crummy iPhone photographs, not going to happen. I, I just Sorry, it just isn't going to happen. And, and, and I've talked to buyers and they just, no, I need to see a lot more. I'm still not sure I want to buy it without, without actually being in there, but I'm definitely not going to buy it based on, you know, based on a few iPhone photos. That's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. We also had the situation where some buyers agents were not accompanying showings. Um, I showed a house, well, not probably three or four weeks ago, where the buyer agent refused to come out. And so I had to go out there and yeah, their buyer show them the home. The buyer's agent refused to come and even unlock the door right. for the buyer. There I mean, go. that's that's not really... Yeah, but uh, so that, that was the situation. Right? Um, mm -hmm. um, we had a situation where one of our, our, our agents went into what was thought mm -hmm. to be an unoccupied home. Turns out to be very much occupied. And there were kids in the bedrooms on computer games and so on. Um, so scary situation. Only, it's only happened once, but be prepared for those scary situations. I should say in that case, the, uh, the agent and the buyers walked right back out again. Yep. So if you're a seller, I wouldn't do that. That's no. not so not so clever, but that was that situation. The did. listing agent should have primed the sellers in explaining the importance of being out of the right. home when a buyer was coming in, because right. you know if a buyer is turning around immediately, they see someone in the home and not viewing the home. That buyer is certainly not going to be buying the home. Yeah. So, um, gloves, masks, and some and, and in some homes, homes uh, those uh, shoe booties are required. So that's kind of there. Um, 
And but you are, you've got a you know a, a number of different ways of kind of viewing the home. You can do everything virtually, um, or you can kind of do virtually and restricted private showings. I think that's the mechanism that the vast majority of buyers find themselves in today. You're doing everything virtually, just as I talked about, and then you're doing that kind of private showing. Um, we have a, a protocol for homes that cannot be viewed, cannot be physically viewed. I think that that was a transient period that will kind of will be yeah. we'll pass that now. Um, all right, inspections. Um, some inspectors are not allowing buyers to attend the inspection. Um, remember that the inspection is a time for you for the the inspector to tell you everything they can and more than you probably want sometimes in terms of that home. You know, you're there, you're learning about everything. Um, so sometimes the report just now includes photographs and videos a phone consultation so a little bit different in terms of the, what you'd expect and you really do need to have confidence in in that extended team as you're making an offer you've got limited access to the home um, you know your buyer agent perhaps not as willing to go out with you as you would expect um, and your inspector not allowing the buyer to attend you know so you've got to have some confidence you know when the inspector says yes this is a good home or no, it's not. Have confidence, you know, kind of in that extended team. That's kind, of, that's kind of key. In terms of financing, I touched on this before. Banks tightening their lending requirements, but here's a different take on this as well. And it's really about the appraisal mechanism. The appraisals previously, the appraiser would come into the home. They might spend 15, 20, 30 minutes in the home, looking at all aspects of the home, asking the listing agent. We, as a matter of course, always go to the appraisal. Um, to explain the features of the home, um, and and to describe that there were eighteen offers on the home, or you know there there was a, a lot of appraisers actually don't know the market that they're coming to do an appraisal in, so we come along with the stats and and data to explain that this is a really strong market. Right, I had that situation the other day. The appraiser came from way up north, so um, mm. but that the appraiser I met the other day went in the home, and we've had the situation where appraisers are simply driving by. That they're, and I think to be fair, if they're driving by, they're probably not driving driving by. They're doing it on Google Maps, no doubt. So they're not actually going inside the home. The challenge with that, of course, is they're not getting all the nuances around the home. They're not getting the explanation of what the market is like. And so there is the potential. We'll see as this kind of plays out. There is the potential there for lower appraisals moving forward, and that spectre of properties not appraising for the for the offer price may well arise. So. We'll see how that plays out, but just something to kind of keep you, uh, uh, make you aware of uh, as we kind of move forward. So just kind of wrap everything up in terms of what is virtual selling and what is virtual buying. So virtual selling, virtual consultation all the way through, be it the staging coordinator, be it preparation services, that's all kind of virtual. Market analysis as well, same thing. Um, it is you know, virtual electronic signatures. We've had those for a long time. It's actually even more so today in terms of electronic signatures. Um, we have just released or about to release a, a listing dashboard, which allows a prospective buyer to see exactly where that transaction is you know, as it. And we should point out it's on a phone. We do it's have a listing dashboard. Yeah, we do have a listing dashboard currently, which is on the computer. Right. But it's now going to. Um, it's all the going to app is just to be uh, just about. Ready to go? Mobile. Yep. yep. By the middle of the month, we'll have rolled this this kind of listing yeah. dashboard, a one-stop shop for a, a seller to understand exactly, you know, how many people have viewed the 3D tour, how popular is it, you know, what what are the specific what dates are coming in, notes fields for us to put information about perhaps a showing that occurred and so on. So all of that's within the in the listing dashboard, um, as well as that digital marketing, as I talked about, restricted showings and and increasingly. Even the closing process is all done virtually, done electronically, e-recording at the registry and so on. So almost the whole transaction can now be done from a seller's perspective um, virtually, clearly you know, preparation and staging not so much quite yet, but, but in terms of um, um, almost all other aspects of it, it's all done electronically. Mm -hmm. Same really applies to the buyers too. Uh, virtual consultation, digital marketing, electronic signatures, virtual, maybe even a hands-off inspection. Um, we have an equivalent buyer's dashboard as we have for a listing dashboard. Once you've got an accepted offer, it takes you through um, exactly when each of those steps are going to be. So you have a, you know, 
a one-stop shop on your phone, a phone but on your phone, um, in terms of what's happening in the market, and then e, um, uh, everything done being done electronically in terms of registering, closing, and so on. Some paperwork to be done at the closing table today. I, I can't help thinking that won't change moving forward, but there's a little bit of paperwork to be done mm -hmm. today. But increasingly, almost everything done virtually. And that's it. And that's why we say thank you. Um, uh, we appreciate uh, having the opportunity to explain what's going on with the market and how this is changing for buyers and sellers. Um, if you want to see a recording of this, it's going to be um, on Facebook. YouTube will have the recording. I'm not sure whether it stays on Twitch. Um, but anyway, there are recordings available or we can send you a link as well. So if you want to just sort of go over a few different uh, things that were covered, um, we can email you a blog post with it. So on that note... We will um, say thank you and... Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>